Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to talk about how to measure your ISIP data written by Chevron and University of Calgary. They provide a new way to measure ISIP data and it's pretty cheap. It's free. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and click on the notification bell as I upload videos every Sunday or earlier than that if I get really excited. Be sure to comment on this video as well, as well as my previous videos. That way I can incorporate your feedback onto future videos. I'll also be uploading new specials known as soft skill specials. These are going to be videos on networking tips, how to land a job, how to be involved in your professional society. As some of the feedback I've gotten in the past, people would be greatly benefit with that kind of information. Well, I hope you enjoy the content in this upcoming video. Hi everyone, today I'm going to talk about post-fracture decay, a novel and free stage level assessment method. This is written by Michael Sullivan and Benam Zanage from Chevron, and, or Benam Zanage is from University of Calgary, and then Austin Springer is from Chevron, and then Chris Clarkson is from the University of Calgary. I bolded the objective here, and I gave some other context in the other bullet points. This is to show, the paper shows a developed method for the analysis of pressure follow-up data following a single stage treatment in a multi-stage fracture simulation. The greater the perm contacted by the fracture stimulation, the greater the rate of pressure follow-up will be. And this is done with as little as 15 minutes of follow-up data, but this is done with a zipper style completion. The, pressure, the surface pressure follow-up of a given fracture stage could be monitored for several hours for no incremental cost while an offset well on the same pad is being stimulated. So it's making use of the fall-off data during zipper well fracks. Here's some more background to give you some context of the study. The frac treatment is pumped simultaneously to all perf clusters in a given stage. So this is using a plug and perf method. So for a zipper frac, the perf and the frac operation will be completed on one of the other wells of the pad. So this presents an opportunity to measure the fall off on a given well while perforating and fracturing operations are sequentially performed on adjacent wells. The time increment available for fall off on a given well is therefore from the time of the frac operations until the next plug and perf pump down operation. So depending on the number of wells that are involved in the zipper frac operation, this can result in one to four hours of measurable pressure fall off. This philosophy is to gather as much data as possible without impacting frac. The post fracture decay, which is what I'll be using as a term quite a bit in this paper, PFPD, analysis was completed on a large number of wells in the Kebab region of Alberta, Canada, targeting the Duvernay Formation. The paper gives more explanation about the geological properties of the Duvernay formation, but for the purpose of this presentation, I only focused on the methodology as opposed to the geologic property. I'll talk a little bit more about the analysis of frac pressure data. The paper gives a lot of good background on the theory of the signatures of the G function, flow regimes identified during DFIT, and different pressure versus time plots to identify frac characteristics. However, I do want to emphasize the main difference between a DFIT and one stage of the main frac treatment in terms of what you'll get out of the analysis. So the pumping volume and the rate for a DFIT is very small compared to a frac stage, and the frac dimensions are much smaller. No prop is injected during a DFIT, and the frac closes on asperities of the fracture walls. In a frac treatment, the fracture closes on propment, resulting in a higher closure pressure, larger residual aperture, and higher fracture conductivity after closure. Follow time in defits range from several hours to several weeks, depending on the objectives of the test. Pressure monitoring after frac stimulation treatment has traditionally been limited to a few minutes, but continuing monitoring of the pressure for up to one to four hours after shut-in is possible when the zipper frac or with little to no impact on operations. This describes the theory and the methodology of the work that was done that was written in the paper. A six well pad with 25 frac stages will have 150 analyzable pressure events. So the analysis has to be quick and simple. The PFPD may be dominated by a water hammer, especially at the very beginning. 
So the frac tip extension and even horizontal are pancake fractures. But in all cases, once these effects have dissipated, the pressure decay will follow a straight line for several hours. This methodology was tested with other time functions, such as the square root of time, as a basis of the plot, but they did not consistently hold a straight line trend. The pressure undergoes an exponential decay and forms a straight line when plotted on a log time scale, and I'll show that in the future slide. The slope of that pressure decay can be used as a stage-by-stage -stage comparative measure of the reservoir permeability connected to each fracture stage. The analysis of this pressure decay, it can get complicated, but the fact that in a zip, factory style zipper frac operation, it's normal to pump the same volume of treatment in each time with the same fluid and at the same rate. Therefore, it is reasonable to compare the frac leak off data from stage to stage. When the treatments are the same from stage to stage, then the decay rates can be used to compare variables that do change, especially if they can be controlled. So that includes differences in reservoir properties between stages, different perf designs, and different frac fluids. The paper also does a good job in giving some guidance on data monitoring and management. So for the pressure recording and the selection and the cost, they provide some options. However, they do emphasize high quality pressure data. And they're also recommending to simply choose a crystal transducer rather than the strain gauge. And a strain gauge can have poor resolution and result in pressure data that have stair steps that are greater than one PSI. The sample rate is one to three second data works well. And of course, with continuous pressure measurement, that's strongly encouraged. So here's the chart that I was talking about that gives you some data that you've obviously seen before during your frac stage treatment. So this is when you had the diverter drop, and this is your rating of the frac treatment. The analyzable pressure decay is about 1.25 hours that's shown over here, especially that's shown by the straight line decline. And that's what I wanted to show over here. The paper also talks about some analysis software and the plots that are suggested. The paper gives a default MDH plot that was found in common pressure transient analysis software, Meyer, Miller, Dyers, and Hutchinson. The analysis of one well with moderate experience could be completed in about four to six hours. But since the formation decay period is reliably seen, within 30 to 60 minutes after initial shut-in, there are opportunities to make the analysis of the data much more efficient through automation or machine learning to automatically extract the pressure decay slope. So this is another plot that I wanted to show as far as what you traditionally see in your MDH plot. The way you wouldn't want to calculate ISIP is during one of these data points where you have the water hammer immediately after shut-in. The depressure decay, when you start measuring, there is a fracture tip extension. So that's typically happening when there's a sharper decline of pressure decay. But once that smooths and that's leak off dominated, that's when you start measuring the slope of your pressure decay. The other benefits that you can get in this post fracture pressure decay analysis that you can extend this all the way to time zero. But since it's a log plot, this was extended to negative three hours or 38.6 seconds after shut-in to get the superior ISIP. The reason why this is called the superior ISIP is this is done without this is done without any subjectivity and it makes it possible to see through the early time noise, for example, that I mentioned that water camera. Here are some of the results from the toe stage defit versus the heel stage post-fracture decay. This first part just talks about the toe stage. You can see over here where there's different types of phenomena that are happening and that can be identified from all of these signatures that are shown on the plot, where you have your time versus DP over DT, and then you have your Bourdais derivative as well, and then you have your PPD plot. You start having your wellbore storage and dominance and your fracture tip extension, which is that sharp decline, or you have start having that pressure decay. Then you have the leak off dominance is where you have that smoother pressure decay. And then you have a progressive fracture closure that's happening, which is where the slope in your time times dp dot dt, the slope starts shallowing or decreasing to where you have a one half slope, 
where you have the reservoir flow dominance. You could finally see the Carter leak off was identified when you have the slope of m equals three halves. This is also some other MDH plot and a G function plot on the plots to the right, where you start having leak off dominance at your shut in time at around probably 0 0.08 hours. And at your G function plot, your start of closure happens a little after 10 at the G function time. Here are the heel stage post fracture pressure decay results of the same well. You'll start noticing the wellbore storage dominance and then the fracture fluid flow and tip extension that happens after 0 .0 or 0 0.008 hours of shed in time. And then you start having your leak off dominance at around, oh, you start having your leak off dominance at around. So to verify the correlation between the pressure decay and the leak off surface area, there was a three-stage fracture treatment was simulated. We're using a 2D couple reservoir geomechanics and finite element program. This table just shows you the simulation settings and then the comparisons between pressure decay rates. So you have your different matrix perm and your fracture surface area and your post-fracture pressure decay rates at the log cycle. The results from the simulation is that pressure decay correlated with the perm and total fracture surface area. If the reservoir quality remained the same, that means a higher rate of pressure decay indicates a larger fracture surface area available for fluid leak off from the hydraulic fracture to the formation. And the way we're assuming reservoir quality is the same as same perm according to the paper. There is also a fiber optic result, or there was also fiber results displaying the pressure decay versus cluster efficiency correlation, and that seemed to correlate pretty well between the number of clusters taking in the frac and you have your pressure decay rate. So the pressure decay rate methodology and the cluster efficiency, they seem to have a positive correlation. The paper also gave some insight on single point entry in validating the methodology of post-fracture pressure decay. So they had both sets of five fracs. So if you could look at the chart on the right or picture on the right, there were two sets and there were five fracs that were done with slick water treatment. The results of the five fracs as far as post-fracture pressure decay was pretty consistent. It was a standard deviation of just 4% in the mean. There was a high Young's modulus rock had a pressure decay rate that was 34% higher than in the low Young modulus rock with eight standard deviations of separation. So one set of clusters was in the high Young modulus and one other set of clusters was in the low Young modulus. So the speculation is that there's a higher rate of pressure decay in the higher Young's modulus rock because of the greater fracture initiation complexity and is due to greater brittleness. But the single point entry work that was done in this paper confirmed the repeatability of the PFPD analysis. There are a couple discussion points that the paper mentioned. For instance, the impact of offsetting frac operations on PFPD, it makes the analysis difficult. When you have poor elastic stress responses, that reduces the time of the follow up data that you could actually analyze. 
There's also a correlation between PFPD and microseismic activity. That isn't well understood according to the paper, but there is a strong correlation between the number of microseismic events and then the decline of the that, and the decay that was seen from the MDH plot. That might suggest that there's greater fracture complexity due to shear failure, and that's detectable with microseismic. The conclusions are well expressed in the paper, but this does confirm the repeatability of PFPD. And I really want to thank you for listening to this presentation. And I really do appreciate any of the comments that you can give on this presentation, as well as other papers I can give technical reviews on. I also wrote down some of my social media handles. I'm pretty consistent on my social media handles, such as my Instagram, my LinkedIn, my Twitter, and my Facebook. Feel free to reach out to me on those platforms. Thank you so much again, and I hope to see you for another time.